participants for this session, session one, uh, which is called, which is themed the post-pandemic emerging global landscape. And it will be moderated and chaired by Ambassador Deepa Vadha. And before I, uh, you know, give the floor to her, I would like to introduce her. Ambassador Deepa Gopalan Vadha has been a distinguished career diplomat who joined the Indian Foreign Service in 1979 and retired in December 2015. She has served as Ambassador of India to Japan between 2012 and 2015, to Qatar uh, 2009 to 2012, and Sweden from 2005 to 2009. She was concurrently accredited as Ambassador to Latvia and Republic of the Marshall Islands from Tokyo. During her career, she also held other significant assignments in Geneva, Hong Kong, China, the Netherlands, the International Labour Organization, and the Ministry of External Affairs. Ambassador Vadva is the chairperson of the India-Japan Friendship Forum, member governing council of the Institute of Chinese Studies, and she's also on the governing council of the Asian Conference based in Shillong. Madam, a very, very warm welcome to you. And of course, uh, this is not the first time that you are part of the International Relations Conference. We've had the honor and the pleasure to hear you speak when you were ambassador to Japan. So very warm welcome to, to you and the floor is all yours, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Lavalle. Um, I think it's only apt that we start with a discussion on the post-pandemic emerging global landscape. Uh, as the world and India at this point reels from the impact of this black swan event for, of, of this COVID-19 pandemic has been one of the biggest disruptors of the century. And what we know is uh, that this is seminally will charge, change the world, affecting not only personal, uh, I think personal destinies, but um, also the, uh, the global economy, uh, politics within countries, between countries, traditional notions of security, lives, livelihoods, and the way of life as we knew it. Uh, while we can hazard predictions on how the post-pandemic world will be, um, how much of it will be new, how much of it will be continuum, we must recognize how dynamic and difficult it is to predict the situation. Uh, when uh, we see that one, it is dictated by, I think, unforeseen mutations and variants. And we see uh, in the case of India itself, I mean, two, uh, about two months ago, the situation was completely different, or maybe even a, a month and a half ago. And, you know, uh, we slipped from being um, uh, sort of the vaccine factory of the world and occupying central stage in vaccine diplomacy to a dire situation of having the highest rate of infections as we have now, and uh, unbearable pressures on our health and medical system, which has resulted in a global SOS and help pouring in from abroad. Uh, this is not to say that we will not overcome these challenges. We, we will, but it's going to be a long haul, which will alter the global landscape and our own place in it definitively. One truth which has emerged is how interconnected our world is, just as forces of deglobalization were gathering force. So while the pandemic has made many countries turn inwards and turn protectionist, with slogans like America first, reshore, diversification of supply chains, uh, shutting borders to migrants, to travel. Uh, there is par paradoxically the realization also, the global, uh, you know, that, that, that the need of the R actually is for more and not less cooperation. An example of this being really the vaccine production itself. So this is really the global challenge at the moment. But I I think what is important is that we have to collaborate, but which countries that we collaborate with will also be dependent on our experience during this pandemic. Um, in this context, China certainly comes to mind, uh, besides being undisputably the country of origin of the virus. China has timed all international efforts to investigate the provenance and the spread. It has bought and brought influence into the UN institutions where it has a say as a, a permanent member of the UN Security Council or in the WHO. It's carried on its aggressive actions, whether in the Himalaya, the, in, in, the, uh, in, in the East China Sea, in the South China Sea, in Taiwan, in Hong Kong. It has railed against anyone who has dared to criticize it with both sanctions and words. So um, the post-pandemic uh, landscape is certainly going to see a change in the assessment of China, 
uh, and headwinds are, you can expect headwinds in, in, in trying to reach or uh, the, in, in its aspirations to be uh, a global, a leading global power. On the security front, we can expect a, a strengthening of existing strategic uh, relationships and also the emergence of new security relationships, uh, relationships uh, uh, of like-minded countries coming together um, with, the, with, with, I think, a greater thrust on the rule of law uh, within courts. Uh, and as E.M. Jayashankar says, the emergence of issue and interest-based mini plurilateral and multilateral groupings. Certainly the pandemic has exposed both the vulnerability of the United States and also its capacity, I think, to overcome uh, you know, the disaster that it faced. But however, the trend is certainly to greater multipolarity. I think this is what we should expect. Um, on the economic front, I'm covering these areas, which I think will be expounded at great length by the experts that we have here. But I just thought I'd, I'd sort of uh, prepare the ground um, for, this, uh, for the topic of the session. On the economic front, the pandemic has and will exacerbate inequalities within nations, as we have seen what has happened in India, between nations. A Barclays report hazards that it will accelerate um, automation, digitization, sustainability. Maybe in, this in a way is posit positive, but of course, automation also means losses of jobs. And reverse international mobility and urbanization. Travel, which accounts for about 10% of GDP, has certainly been affected. But it's not travel and the travel, the hospitality industry per se. But this also means, I mean, students going abroad to study. And in our case, I mean, migrant labor. I think in this case, it's certainly going to affect our own relations with uh, the GCC. Uh, because as you know, a lot of our, uh, our workers, they've had to come back. Uh, in the context of also uh, on uh, uh, supply chains, I think a word we hear very often nowadays is, is resilience. It's one of the most uh, touted words with, with respect to the security of, uh, of, of supply chains and countries' uh, efforts to be able to secure supplies, goods and services. Uh, the domination of China in certain critical technologies um, and in supply chains, I think, is, um, is sought to be countered. I think through other groupings, as we've already seen in the tour, we've seen the, uh, the Japanese trying to diversify their dependence, uh, reshore and diversify their dependence on, on China. And um, so on the positive side, what we can expect, and this is, you know, as I said, we can only hazard is what we've seen post uh, this recent summit that we've had the, on, 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 on climate change, is that uh, there's going to be perhaps a global demand for more greener policies. Uh, with vulnerability exposed, global vulnerability explo uh, exposed through this pandemic, perhaps we'll be more sensitive to what climate change can bring up on us. Um, and important, um, I think an important uh, also aspect of um, the post-COVID world is uh, what Ambassador Talmiz Ahmed will be speaking about, uh, which is, you know, uh, what kind of leadership are we going to find? I mean, the populist leaders that are there were already there before. But the point is, are we going to hold them accountable? Are they going to be held accountable at, at the hustings, as happened with the case of, uh, in the case of Trump, uh, or in any other way? But you know, that, that is going to be a trend we should watch. Uh, insofar as India is concerned, we have played and will continue to play a strategic role in, this, in the changed uh, world, despite, I think, the setback that we are facing at this point of time. Um, uh, we had Jayashankar say recently that, um, India will reach out and approach the world in a much more proactive way post the pandemic. Uh, and you can see this in some ways, including in the, um, the agreement to join some form of institutionalized board. Um, so this is sort of the background that I thought, these are some of the changes that occurred to me, but um, we have a very, very eminent panel and I'm really looking forward to hearing from them. Um, we have a panel of Dr. Raja Mohan, Ambassador Talmiz Ahmad and Dr. Sandeep uh, Vaslekar. I will briefly introduce them. And thereafter, um, you know, we look forward to hearing from them. Hope at the end of it, after their presentation, that we will have some time for questions too. So I start with Dr. Raja Mohan, very well known. I think even more well known in these days when we're all uh, subjected uh, to webinars, not, you know, I think seeing much more of each other in a way. So Dr. Raja Mohan is the director of the Institute of South Asian Studies at the National University of Singapore and contributing editor on foreign affairs for the Indian Express. 
Previously, he was founding director of Carnegie India. He's also a distinguished fellow at the Observer Research Foundation, New Delhi, and senior fellow at the Center for Policy Research, New Delhi. Uh, prior to that, uh, Dr. Rajamohan was a professor at the S. Rajaratnam School of International Studies, Nanyang Technical University, Singapore, and professor of the Center for Central, Southeast Asian, and Southwest Pacific Studies at the SIS at JNU. Uh, Dr. Rajamohan um, was a member of the NSAB, the National Security Advisory Board, uh, from 1998 to 2000, then 2004 to 2006. Uh, he is a well known author, as we all know. Uh, several books, uh, uh, including Crossing the Rubicon, Shaping of India's Foreign Policy, um, Impossible Allies, Nuclear India, the United States and the Global Order. And uh, one of his uh, recent works, which I quite enjoyed, was Samudra Manthan. He is a very sort of well-known um, analyst, um, uh, a well-known person, in fact, on, on the foreign policy and security um, stage. So. Um, we look forward to hearing from him. I must add, he was awarded the, uh, the highest French distinction of Chevalier de la Légion d'Honneur. I hope I say that right. Anyway, Knight of the Legion of Honor in 2016. With that, I'd like to introduce the next, uh, the, the next speaker, Ambassador Talmiz Ahmed. Um, he is um, a, a former Indian ambassador to Saudi Arabia, Oman, and the UAE. After retirement from the Foreign Service, he, may I say, is even more busy than he's ever been before. That's not in the CV, but I'd like to say that. And is now a full-time academic and writes extensively on political Islam, the politics and economics of West Asia, Eurasia, and the Indian Ocean, energy security issues. He holds a Ram Sathe Chair for International Studies at the Symbiosis International University, Pune. Uh, wonderful to have you on this panel, uh, Ambassador Ahmed. And um, the third and equally eminent speaker today is Dr. Sandeep Vaslekar. Uh, he is the president of a strategic foresight group, an international think tank that has worked with 65 countries on global challenges. His work has been discussed in the United Nations Security Council, World Bank, European Parliament, Indian Parliament, the UK House of Commons, House of Lords, World Economic Forum at Davos, among other institutions. Uh, he has studied at Oxford University and is currently a senior research fellow of the Center for the Resolution of Intractable Conflicts at Oxford University. Uh, he was conferred a DLIT um, at Symbiosis by the President of India. He is also the author of a bestseller in Marathi, and if I hope I say it right, it's Eka Dishecha Shod, which has 23 editions. So as I said, we have an extremely um, eminent panel the, uh, we will start with um, uh, Dr. Raja Mohan, uh, who will be talking about the security scenario in this post-COVID uh, world. Um, it'll be followed by uh, a look by uh, Dr. Vaslekar, who will speak about the economic and geopolitical scenario, and then we wait to hear from Ambassador Ahmad. I think uh, it's about 15 minutes each, and then uh, you know we, we can get some questions on. So over to you, Raj. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Wadwa. Thank you for that uh, generous introduction. And I think uh, you've also uh, laid out the, the broad set of issues uh, that confront us at this uh, really dark moment, uh, especially uh, for, for India. Uh, I also want to thank uh, the Symbiosis Institute for inviting me uh, uh, again uh, for, this, uh, for this annual conference, which has become an important uh, uh, part of uh, India's uh, international relations uh, calendar. Uh, and I want to congratulate the Symbiosis team for really making this such a such an attractive event for 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 everyone. Uh, I think the one of the issues that Ambassador Wadwa talked about how the pandemic might change the world around us in in deep and fundamental ways. Uh, it's also possible, I think, uh, to think of this actually. The pandemic has actually accelerated the trends that were already visible before. But I think. What the pandemic has done is to really uh, sh sharpen, intensify uh, those trends that, that had already existed. Uh, for example, the, the rise of China uh, and its impact on the, uh, the global uh, distribution of power and major power relations. A uh, second, Ambassador Watwa also pointed to the way the international institutions and structures are changing uh, because of the dramatic 
rise of China uh, in the in the international system in the last few years. Uh, it's also possible, I think, uh, to 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 say the uh, that India India's challenges have become a lot more demanding uh, under the under the pandemic, and as we've seen, uh, just when we thought we were out of the uh, tunnel, uh, we we back in it, and and the kind of challenges that it presents to to India. So, so I think the trend lines were there before, but those have become a lot worse uh, in terms of the international security. So let me focus on three broad themes uh, on, on, on security. Uh, the first is the, uh, what I want to talk about is really the, the return of the great power rivalry. Uh, since the end of the Cold War, the collapse of the Soviet Union, it looked like everyone, every one of the major powers was getting along with the other. Uh, there was the economic globalization. So uh, it was talk about everyone integrating uh, with each other. And uh, especially the US-China uh, integration, which provided a, a fundamentally different basis for Asia and our part of the world uh, to engage with the, with the, with the international system. Uh, so, but what, what we, uh, uh, Chinese, uh, China's, you know, uh, if you see today, I mean, I think few, uh, everyone knew China was doing well because four decades of growth, at, at double digit growth was going to make China a, a very different kind of power. But few had expected it uh, to close the gap with the number one power, the United States, in such a short period of time. Uh, today, the US GDP is around $21 trillion, and China is at 15. And every expectation is that uh, China is going to, uh, to get there uh, much more uh, faster than anyone had anticipated. And in a sense, the pandemic, with China, the, it is a place of origin, managed to crush it quickly, decisively, uh, you could argue with the means. But it has done that, while the rest of the world, largely most of the other powers are struggling to deal with that challenge and continue to struggle uh, to deal with the challenge. And that uh, sets the Chinese economy, I think, in a, in a, in a footing at this point. Uh, it looks like uh, it, is, it is going to do a lot better than the others uh, in the near future. Uh, on the military front, uh, is really uh, today, the U.S. military spending is still one of the highest, it is the highest in the world, around uh, close to $780 billion. But China has caught up because of its high GDP. It's now close to $250 billion. So it's one third of the U.S. defense expenditure. But what matters is not the total amount that is being spent. What impact does it have on the Indo-Pacific, or most especially on the Western Pacific, that the relative balance between China and the US is dramatically changing and changing by the day. And this has consequences. That is, for nearly 70 odd years since the end of the Second World War, American military dominated the front yard of, the, uh, of China uh, in, the, in, the, in the Pacific. Uh, today, the Chinese military power, uh, its extraordinary modernization of its military forces uh, is putting uh, great pressure uh, on the Ch American forward military presence and on the US uh, alliances. So the sustainability of can America sustain its military presence so close to China's uh, front yard as Chinese capability uh, increases to, to push them uh, outward. And I think uh, if you think of the uh, next few years, it is this tension between these two powers, uh, which is now is no longer just a question of military. Uh, it is political because China claims today an ideological superiority uh, that it is success in handling the pandemic its superiority as an ideological system, uh, its ability to undermine the US economy, uh, and its ability to uh, alt offer alternative pathways. So on the economic side, on the ideological side, and on the institutional side, uh, China seems to present a challenge uh, which, the United, uh, which Russia never really presented to the, uh, to the United States. And so therefore, this conflict is going to be the central uh, element, I think, for everyone in the world. I mean, how we deal with this uh, is going to be the uh, major question, uh, and this is going to encompass uh, on all, all if, you know, on the international trading system, on the international institutions, and on the nature of the technological development. For nearly four and a half decades, we had US and China on the same side. But today, uh, as uh, President Biden said, look, he's promised extreme competition, and China is not backing off. China is ready saying we are ready for the game on. So, so you have this two powers now determined to contest. And I think the consequences uh, are ripples are going to be uh, all around uh, for everyone. The second set of points, I want to focus on some of the consequences of this confrontation and of the change in the distribution of power between these two 
uh, uh, to, to highlight some of those. One is uh, alignments. I think we're going to see uh, some align, new alignments, uh, some realignment, uh, some dealignment. Uh, that you, the assumption that the old institutions, that NATO or the US military alliances in Asia are set in stone and that nothing is going to change them. I think that structure is changing, uh, for example, in the NATO and in the EU, which was seen as uh, powerful institutions, uh, China's influence uh, within those has significantly increased. It has set up its own institution of uh, you know, 16 plus one or 17 plus one in uh, Central Europe. Its relationship with a large number of European powers has dramatically increased. Russia, which is barely $1.6 trillion of economy, uh, is ready to create a huge run rings around the European Union, which is supposed to be a larger power. Uh, that So therefore you have actually the assumption that NATO and EU are so strong, but both are being uh, you know, tested, not by individually by Russia and China, and also the alliance between uh, Russia and China. Uh, so the no institution today can be taken for granted. Uh, we've also seen the creation of new institutions, uh, like the Quad, uh, which everyone is debating, Certainly it's work in progress. Uh, in India that is kind of consciously kept away from plurilateral security organizations are uh, today is actively participating uh, in one of those. And I think we could argue about it, what it means. But the fact is there is India today, a member of the Quad and, and uh, it looks like uh, it's going to be very much a part of India's uh, you know, institutional landscape we're going to see. But uh, there is also de-alignment. While India is realigning itself, uh, there are countries that are de-aligning. For example, South Korea, supposed to be a treaty ally of the United States. Today, its economic dependence on China is so much. Uh, anyone who can assume that South Korea is just going to do whatever the Americans tell them uh, is, is fundamentally mistaken. Thailand, Philippines, these are two of the oldest military allies of the United States. But today, they're so close to China uh, that, that very few of them are going to stand up and, in fact, Philippines, you are the president actively uh, criticizing the United States. And the Thailand, uh, that, is the, that is today closer to China than to, the, than to the United States. So the presence of such a massive power in Asia is going to undermine the kind of institutions we have taken for granted for the last 75 years. Uh, but there are others who are changing. Japan is because of the threat it faces from China is getting into stronger relationship with the United States. Australia, which at one time fully gone with the Chinese, is today rethinking its policy, recalibrating it, and returning to a closer relationship with the US. So you're going to see uh, fundamental realignments. And the ASEAN, uh, which all, all of us talk about as centrality, but it is under pressure uh, in this new competition uh, between the major powers. So alignment, dealignment, and realignment are going to be very much part of the security landscape uh, that we have to deal with uh, in, the, in the coming years. That brings me to the third set of uh, issues in the security scenario, which is really largely about India. Uh, India's challenges have dramatically mounted. I think there is no escaping that. And the pandemic has actually made things worse. Uh, because if you remember, the India's economy was slowing down well before the, the, the pandemic crisis. And the pandemic has set us back. Uh, massive reduction, shrinkage of the economy last year. And the hopes that we're going to have a dramatic V-shaped growth uh, in, 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 from this year is again going to be tested uh, because of the return of the pandemic in a far more uh, intensive, intensive manner. The second, uh, so, the, so the India's rise, which most people see is inevitable and is going to happen because India's economy is going to continue to grow. But the pace of that growth is, is going to be slower. Uh, we've been stuck on $2.8 trillion for a long time. So our relative power vis-a-vis uh, -vis China uh, is going to come down. And, and I think despite our, you know, the growth, that is going to be a problem. So the power gap between India and China uh, is going to increase uh, in, the, in the near term. Uh, and, and the important thing about China, I think the China's rise for India is India has never had a great power on its frontiers. We never had to deal with a powerful entity on our frontiers. In fact, the British Raj was the powerful entity that actually influenced China. It influenced uh, the Arabia, Middle East, the Indian Ocean, Southeast Asia. Uh, today, uh, it is another great power on our doorstep. 
and the us was never uh, us was closer to china in a sense uh, you know right next door to china doing alliances in the cold war today of course later they became friends uh, india never had to deal with a massive military economic power on its frontier the way we have to deal with it today and it is uh, chinese power radiates into the subcontinent its military power threatens our frontiers and it is going to test india's traditional relationships uh, with its own uh, you know neighbors which which we're going to see uh, already on the vaccine side where india seemed to be on the gaining ground a couple of months ago today uh, the chinese are going to make big advances and and uh, what we've seen happen in the last uh, decade repeated military crisis on the frontier 2013 2014 2017 and 2020 the scale of that crisis where the chinese military power can continue to test india and try to redeem china's claims which means our frontier security uh, is a big challenge and in the south china was never in the india's waters but today a uh, chinese are getting you know as chinese navy expands it's inevitable i mean it's not good or bad the fact is chinese navy is going to be around and the reports that uh, they built a big uh, you know pier in uh, djibouti to host chinese aircraft carrier so if uh, western powers could come into the indian ocean we shouldn't be shocked that china is going to come the question for us is as china comes in what do we do as china envelops india both in the himalayas as well as in the in the in the indian ocean side india will have to respond I mean, to that to the challenge and i think we've seen some outlines of that and the quad is is one of that but more deeply i think the challenge for is india is uh, is one thing to talk about multi alignment but how do we actually construct that policy Uh, because historically if you go back to the 70s 60s late 60s 70s uh, india relied on the soviet union as a way of fending off the chinese challenge that india china uh, contentions coincided with the india russia warmth in the cold war but today china and russia are closer to each other uh, than russia is to to india so therefore uh, we have a problem on that front uh, russians will know how to manage it but Uh, we also will have to find ways of uh, managing that the the fundamental change that is uh, that is taking place so i think for us the question is what kind of coalitions do we build merely talking about multi alignment or merely talking about strategic autonomy merely saying we are will forever be non aligned and those are issues of process but the question is how does india accrete to its power how does india reduce the power differential with china now how does india secure Uh, its interest at a time when its external environment is so uh, fundamentally uh, changed in manner in which uh, none of us could have uh, could have imagined so i think that is the challenge and i think it is taking place at a time when our economy is slowed down and when uh, the 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 problem of overcoming india's internal fault lines historically uh, everyone knows india's biggest uh, vulnerability is its internal divisions and i think those have clearly sharpened so therefore i think india has a challenge if it wants to secure its interests it needs to reform a lot more strengthen its economy strengthen a whole lot of other things like your healthcare system the basics that we talk about as well as produce a new level of unity internally uh, which would prepare india politically to deal with the uh, extraordinary uh, external challenges that it confronts so as i come to the end of my time i mean let me just conclude by saying the three things that we talked about one a fundamental once in a generation shift in the great power relationship that is the rise of china uh, is going to transform the international system because compared to soviet union compared to all the so called european great powers which all of us study in ir courses is nothing here we're talking about a 1.4 billion people marching with under a you know unified leadership at least apparent purposes the impact of this is going to be quite dramatic and nothing and no one is going to be more affected than india because the india china is india's neighbor unlike in the cold war when we could talk about us russia cold war to something distant but today china is on our doorstep this this makes the dealing with this new uh, issue a uh, far more complicated and as i said india never had to deal with a major power on its borders and there we are we're going to find one uh, and and uh, next uh, for the next generation as a whole uh, dealing with that power is going to be our challenge and then the third issue which which i talked about is really uh, we got to build coalitions how do we build coalitions because india until now never had the habit of working with other people either it's my way or highway 
uh, either I'm alone or occasionally I do an alliance with the Soviet Union. But otherwise, I'm not going to work in teams. I go to the UN, I'm a great multilateralist or I'm, I'm a great unilateralist. But how do you work in coalitions with other powers? That is the test. And I think that is the uh, real challenge for India going ahead. Ambassador Wadhu, I've taken one minute more, I think. I'll stop there. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Rajamohan. That's most interesting. And what is interesting is that in all the three aspects that you talk about, there is one big elephant in the room, and it's China, China, China. And I think this is what we all have to grapple with. So when you look at the security landscape post-pandemic, I think we're going to have China looming very large you know, in, in every area. And particularly for India, I think there is um, a great challenge. Very perceptive um, analysis and um, um, you know, particularly the, the fact that, you know, I, I keep saying this because everyone thinks that there's the pandemic and then there's going to be a new world, but actually a lot of it is continuum. But as you say, that uh, the pandemic has just sort of exacerbated and, and sharpened the trends that were there. Thank you very much. It was very interesting. Uh, now, uh, over to you, Mr. Uh, Vaslekar. Um, we look forward to hearing from you on the economic and the geopolitical scenario. The floor is yours, sir. Thank you, uh, Ambassador Vadwa. And uh, first of all, I want to compliment uh, Dr. Muzumdar and uh, the entire team of Symbiosis for building such a fine international relations institute away from Delhi uh, in Pune and for so consistently uh, uh, hosting the international relations conference every year despite so many difficulties uh, that you face from time to time and 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 i must compliment shivali uh, the director and and the entire team uh, for this i wish we were meeting in person but uh, i admire that you are still made it possible uh, despite the pandemic uh, and and all the practical difficulties the pandemic there is one big myth about this pandemic uh, this covid 19 pandemic and that lot of people treat it as a surprise. People think this was not anticipated. It has come as a surprise. Uh, and so we didn't know how to respond to it as governments, as international institutions. And we couldn't therefore uh, respond to its social implications, economic implications, and first of all, the, 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 uh, the implications for the health uh, infrastructure of the countries around the world. Uh, but in September 2019, uh, which is three months before this pandemic was uh, uh, kind of observed in China, uh, there is a uh, global pandemic uh, observation board set up by the WHO and uh, the World Bank jointly, headed by uh, Gro Harlem Brundtland, former prime minister of Norway. It issued a public report in September 19 which want about not this pandemic, but a pandemic which is very similar to the one that we are experiencing now. And in fact, uh, it, is a, it was a public uh, report and they said that we will soon uh, uh, have uh, a, a pathogen which will be crossing from one country to another in a very short period of time at extremely fast pace. And it will lead to probably 50 million deaths. So in fact, what was anticipated was uh, much bigger than what has happened, and 5% drop in the, in the global GDP. What we are looking at possibly, if we, uh, if we assume that this uh, malaise will go on for another one year or 10 months or six months or so, probably four to five million deaths and maybe 150 to 200 million infections. So that's about 2% of the world population being uh, infected. Uh, so that is one. So it was not totally unanticipated. Secondly, in October, of 2019, immediately a month after uh, Gro Harlem Bundtland report was out, uh, Bill Gates uh, sponsored a major exercise only for the US administration uh, in Washington DC, where they looked at the economic implications of a pandemic of this nature, including all the closures, including the uh, ban on the flights, including stoppage of production facilities, manufacturing unit, etc. And, and all the top players of the US administration had participated in this exercise. And again, the report of this exercise was made available, at least a summary of it uh, to the public. Now, despite this, there was no action taken by anybody in the world to try to anticipate what could possibly happen. Then next, in January 2020, uh, when the, when the COVID-19 had already uh, set in in China and, and, and people had observed it, uh, and uh, 
New York Times uh, was carrying picture from uh, Wuhan in January 2019. On 25th January, the U.S. shifted or uh, closed its its consulate in Wuhan uh, uh, as a response to the threats coming from the from the pandemic, and shifted all the American uh, diplomats and uh, and several other American citizens to San Francisco in emergency flights. Now I don't know if the U.S. administration then, which was led by President Trump. Used to claim great friendship with India and number of other countries. Whether they briefed the Indian government and whether they briefed the other friendly governments that they were shifting out of Wuhan and and that they had observed a pandemic or not. I don't know. Some of the other people who are participating in this conference today and tomorrow will be better informed. But but the information on the on the pandemic was available to the extent that the Americans took uh, an executive decision uh, 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 under the jurisdiction of the State Department. And a few days later, on 30th of January, you had uh, the Director General of WHO uh, making a public announcement of a global health emergency. Now, whether WHO is co-opted by China or not is a different story. But the point is that he did make a public announcement of global health emergency on 30th of January, 2020. Now, normally, what would happen if you are responsible leaders of nations? You would all get together uh, immediately in a digital conference or through special envoys or ambassadors or whatever within two to three days, and you will start discussing that the emergency has been announced. Now, how do you respond to this emergency on all fronts, including health, uh, uh, economic, social, and on all fronts? And if they had met in such a way, they could have perhaps decided on closure of flights from certain countries. They could have decided on airport testing. They could have decided on uh, uh, very fast movement of. Uh, Certain equipment, but there was no such discussion. Not only that, 15 days later, on 14 February, from 14 to 16 February, uh, foreign ministers of many important countries, and along with defense minister of some countries, jointly met and spent a weekend together in Munich at the Munich Security Conference. And there was no discussion that is known outside, at least, uh, on the pandemic. So, 15 days after the WHO declares a global health emergency. Foreign ministers and senior leaders of all countries are meeting, including Mike Pompeo, the U.S. Uh, the Secretary of State was there. The Chinese Foreign Minister was there. The Americans had certain uh, 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 say charges against China, but the Chinese Foreign Minister was there. And there and then they could have discussed and they could have agreed on closure of certain air, uh, airlines and and so many other things. But nothing was done. Why I'm saying this is that. Uh, there are scientists who have now issued a warning that there are 825,000, that is 8 lakh 25,000 viruses, which could possibly affect human beings, which are coming from mammals and from 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 uh, birds and animals. So this pandemic is not the last last pandemic that we are uh, going to face. That we might come across many more dangerous uh, pandemics in future. and unless we are prepared for that prepared to deal with them uh, we are going to have a, a serious problem we will we will uh, come out of this pandemic one way or the other in the next few months then we will uh, after a, one or two years we might face another pandemic and that could be much more severe and maybe we'll come out of that and then again we might come so so one of the lessons is that we have to make, create some kind of a proactive machinery Both at the national level within India, since it's a big country with more than 1.4 billion population, to see if future pandemics arrive, what are you going to do? You must have some kind of an anticipation, uh, some kind of a forecasting and 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 preparation exercise, and also at the international level, what kind of a coordination you want in case of future pandemics. So the European Union has recently suggested a global pandemics prevention treaty, and uh, the president of the European Union has floated it along with the heads of government of 24 countries. and uh, i never saw any coverage of this in the indian press because it doesn't look like a priority in india that there is a there is a there is a solution being offered very concretely with very concrete specific operational uh, articles of this treaty which are in discussion internationally i don't see them anywhere in the indian media i don't see them in the american media because for america and india these are not the priorities i don't see them in the chinese media so but they are there in the international media outside of us china india uh, so one thing is to perhaps look at uh, how this global pandemic prevention treaty can be promoted and whether it could be one of the possible options for preventing future crises now coming to the current uh, covid-19 crisis and its economic impact uh, what has happened in 2020 for which data is available january to december 
the uh, international uh, travel came down by 75 percent. So in 2019, uh, there were about two billion people who travelled. Of course, you have to take into account that some may have travelled more than once, but there were two billion tourist arrivals or international arrivals uh, globally. In 2020, that number fell down to 500 million. So about 75 percent drop in 2020 in the international travel. And along with that, you can imagine the implications for uh, 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 hospitality industry, for hotels, for airlines. Uh, uh and everything that goes with that but as compared to a 75% drop in international uh, uh services in in um, travel the drop in trade was not all that bad in mercantile trade in 2019 the total drop in mercantile trade was only 10% in fact 9% in entire 2019 so the trade was going down in the second and third quarter and in the fourth quarter of 2020 uh, so as compared to 2019 in the 2020 it was going down in the second and third quarter and in the fourth quarter of 2020 the trade jumped it bounced back again uh, the world world exports and so in 2019 the 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 international uh, exports the total global exports were about 20 billion dollars and in 2020 they came down to 18 18.5 billion dollars so it was not such a big uh, uh, drop and what it shows also is the resilience of the of the trading sector so in 2021 again as, as the pandemic uh, gets bad there will be a drop in the mercantile trade but the moment you have uh, some kind of a relief the moment some avenues open we will see the trade again bouncing back so the so the trade has shown shown the resilience thirdly the investments the short term investments are very resilient i mean if you look at the bombay stock exchange just in the last 5 days when the whole country is suffering from uh, 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 the coronavirus uh, in its worst forms with all kinds of shortages on all fronts the bombay stock exchange is booming i mean today the sensex is about 50000 what does it uh, show and, and most of the bombay stock exchange as you know well is is mostly funded by foreign investor these days not by the uh, not by the indian investors uh, so Uh, Indian investors operate; they form the base. But really, the movement in the Sensex takes place with uh, with the uh, uh, sh short-term capital flow from uh, the West. So, Bombay Stock Exchange is booming. You have fifty thousand, and in fact, people are talking about going up further. So, if you want to buy shares, you can buy them uh, and benefit in the next six months while the country goes down in the pandemic. Uh, so, the investments are uh, uh, resilient, and is the same with the stock exchanges around the world. There is no big stock market crash that has happened. Uh, in the world in any stock market and the long term investments are also resilient if you just take the case of the indian vaccine uh, that showed you that that every uh, endeavor these days it's bound in very complicated supply chain what we called covid shield at least i don't know about covaxin uh, but at least covid shield we call it indian vaccine but it is really research and development done in oxford the marketing is done by astrazeneca the uh, uh, vital inputs are coming from the united states and manufacturing is done in india it is a multinational vaccine we might have national pride to call it an indian vaccine but uh, but this is very much a multinational vaccine but everything is multinational the phone that you are using the laptop you are using uh, the iphone that lot of people use this iphone and 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 all the uh, products of that uh, steve jobs company they are all manufactured in china by a taiwanese company and only marketed by uh, uh, iphone so you can talk about uh, problems with china and all that but is uh, is the apple going to close uh, its operations in china or is it going to ask the taiwanese company to um, close the operations in china is that going to be possible uh, so the supply chains have made the investment process uh, uh, very difficult it's very nice to say we'll shift out of china we'll shift out of uh, here shift out of there but uh, how are your supply chains going to uh, function how are you going to dis uh, figure the supply chains we can't even make our own vaccine uh, by disrupting the supply chains at at this time so supply chains are there they are going to be there so that is uh, there so so the economic impact is complex it's going to be uh, complex so the final point that i want to make since i don't want to take uh, much more time that's been given to me it's that the 
just like the uh, impact on the health infrastructure and just like the impact on the uh, on the on the economy uh, the socio economic impact that's going to happen and uh, our chairperson ambassador wadwa referred to it in her uh, introductory remarks about the kind of inequality uh, this is bound to create that uh, so when we look at economic impact we look at the stock market and we look at supply chains but what about the economy of those uh, who, who are from the bottom 50% of the population what is their what is the implications of their economy now there are some interesting things are happening not only in india but all over the world that some centers of growth have emerged during covid for example if you look at real estate prices in places like satara in maharashtra which is not too far from pune where shivali are sitting or uh, you look at mysore the famous uh, historic place real estate prices are going up because a lot of people have now shifted to the smaller towns and they are working out of there and they are creating local supply chains for agriculture and for some of the other essential things so but there are other people like those who are uh, whom we call migrant labor they are going to be uh, affected and their economy is going to go down so so supply chain uh, of this very poor people is going to be affected and uh, there is going to be a lot of relocation that's happening and whether these people will come back after the uh, 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 this story is over I, we don't know but in the long run the economy is not going to be hampered as much as we think because there have been crises in the history of the world for last 2000 years or last 3000 4000 years this whole economic story started uh you know 5000 years ago when the world exchange uh, 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 world trade started 5000 years ago particularly 2500 years ago the global trade really started intensifying investment started following them the uh, we have had two world wars in the last century we had so many other wars in the last century we had plague in the 14th century we had spanish flu in the last century so crisis will come crisis will go but those economic actors they are pretty shrewd they know how to survive they will keep on survive and they will keep on expanding but the society will be affected political systems will be affected and so it is really important one of the conclusions that you might want to consider out of a conference like this is the need for undertaking anticipatory exercises need for looking into future the need for foresight the need for uh, 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 looking ahead and the, the need for for understanding signals the need for interpreting signals and the need to take preparatory steps legal steps coordination steps uh, social steps uh, economic steps and and political steps i'll stop there thank you very much madam chairman um thank you very much uh, dr vaslekar uh, that was most interesting i must say the most scary part of this was the fact of this 8 lakh 25000 viruses hanging around there i mean you know we have heard about i mean the possibility of pandemics people have known the sars you know when it happened first in in but it was an east asian problem and i think it has been a little bit of crying wolf in a sort of way and i don't think um, you know that we really thought this pandemic would be of the dimensions it was you talk about this eu mechanism but i do know there was a who mechanism also which i think for pandemics which really didn't work in the end but um, certainly we take your point that you say that there is a need for anticipatory action in india if you see between the first wave and this wave we didn't learn didn't seem to have learned enough and that's why we are in the situation we are so i think that'll be a good takeaway from this conference that you know we should have protocols in place um if if something like this should happen again so now i have great pleasure in um, inviting ambassador talmiz ahmed um you have the floor thank you deepa let me pick up where sandeep left off we live in a globalized world there are extraordinary transnational connectivities whether it is trade finance information technology and human resources massive movements of people across borders and the at the root of this at the base of this is technology we take a lot of technology for granted today because become an integral part of our life but do recall it's of very recent origin the connectivity is that we have uh, because of our internet the mobile phone all of these are in the last 30 years or so and they are today a very powerful impact a very powerful part of our life and if we investigate this subject further what do we see massive changes taking place we hear about robotics artificial intelligence gene editing 
cloning and all these interesting developments that are taking place all around us. And of course, all of that is linked with uh, software development. Today, there is, in fact, it is very difficult to distinguish between software and manufacture. Well, everything that we have, which is, uh, say, for example, industry or transport, communication, all of these are propelled by technology, by software technology. And otherwise, they would not function at all. Uh, many of people give examples of the of a modest item like the Uber taxi, that it functions on the basis of connectivity provided by software. But there has been an impact. What has all this meant for us in our life? Large numbers of people in every nation are not part of this dramatic success story. They are not qualified enough to make a contribution and to become participants in this adventure. They are the have-nots. They are the marginalized. They are the excluded. They look out around them in a democratic environment and seek a certain leadership that would understand their predicament and possibly contribute to their welfare. And they find that the existing democratic setup no longer has time for them. We have heard the word that they don't listen to me. Even when you had, uh, if you look back a little bit, when Hillary Clinton was competing with Trump, Hillary Clinton had the aura of being linked with Wall Street, being with the establishment. And here was this maverick politician, a billionaire self style with not a very savory record, who actually became the representative of those marginalized and the, and the excluded. It is in this background that you find in diverse democratic societies, the emergence of leaders who we now refer to as populist. Actually, this is a very interesting scenario because populism is a very new concept in political theory. Writings about populism emerged well before we had populist leaders uh, self-defined as such today. Now, of course, we are familiar with Donald Trump, Bolsonaro, Orban, uh, Boris Johnson, and Mr. Narendra Modi. But they, the writings that started earlier, where there were political writers in Europe who saw that there was something happening in the democratic society. And what was happening? That a large number of people left out were angry. They were dissatisfied with the political order. They were dissatisfied with the choices given to them with regard to the electoral process. They, the writers thought of them or wrote of them as the innocent, the good, the, and the hardworking. They were the good people. And who were they ranged against? They were ranged against an elite. An elite in the democratic process that was selfish, self-centered. And it is in this, uh, this divide, this divide created a space for the emergence of leaders who would, add, who would say that we represent the innocent, the simple, the pure, ordinary people, the hardworking people against these wretched elite who are corrupt, who have built up, uh, who have built up alliances with minority groups, who are hostile to the mainstream of national life. This uh, populism, according to early writers, is a thin ideology. It merely focuses on the divide between the good people and the corrupt elite. It doesn't talk about the larger issues of politics, of economics, of culture. It is a thin ideology and therefore has to borrow heavily uh, from both the left tradition and from the right tradition. What have we seen now? We've had some experience of populist leaders. What have we seen now? That at the center of populist politics is the leader. So it is a very leader. It's not ideology led. It's not concept led. It is leader led. It's a leader led. The leader emerges as the voice of the ordinary 
And because he is the legitimate voice of the ordinary people, you don't need any other voice in the political order. He is sufficient in himself. He takes control of the entire state order. He takes control because other institutions, the traditional institutions of state order, are no longer listening to the ordinary people and certainly do not represent their interests. Here is this messiah-like figure who emerges. We have also the opportunity of looking at some of the shared characteristics of populist leaders. They are divisive. They are polarizing figures. Obviously, the political order from which they emerge is a divided order. Good people versus the other. Literally hear the other. The other is demonized. The other is scapegoated. The other is even criminal. It harms the interests of the good people. The people identified as those whom he is going to lead. He loves crisis. If there is no crisis, he creates a crisis. There is a state of tension in the political order at which he is the heart. Because there are all around, there are conspiracies. Conspiracies to undermine him and undermine his ability to lead and to represent. And this is where. But for his own people, he's the paternal. He's a, he's a father figure. He's a powerful commander-in-chief when required. He is the thinking, gravitas, philosophical uh, person who is constantly reflecting on what the people need. He's the world's most astute diplomat because he is agitating constantly for the interests of his people. He has no patience with institutions. Traditional democratic institutions get in the way. The judiciary, the watchdog institutions, the regulatory and supervisory institutions, the media, they all sing the song of the corrupt elite. He has to undermine them and he has to reform them. What has been happening during the pandemic? First, let us look at the economic side. The pandemic, initially, there was a rejection of globalization. Political emer leaders emerged, as Deepa pointed out, America first. War of independence. Let us free ourselves from this. And of course, there was a certain direction uh, with regard to China. Why are we so dependent for medicines, for protective clothing, for generic uh, formulations, all dependent on these others. We should have all of that with us. So yes, initially, there was a certain shift in favor of nationalism as against globalization. But this is not likely to stay long. We are already a seriously globalized entity. The world is globalized. We are globalized by technology already. We are connected. We are linked. Every aspect of our life is connected. Today, it is rare to find any, any enterprise that is truly nationalistic, whatever the slogans of the leadership might be. We are all, But what we could see, we could see a certain change. Instead of having this transcontinental uh, value change, we could have them nearer and shorter. No need to get everything from China. You could see a certain shift in favor of Vietnam, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, or possibly even India. Uh, you could have that shorter value chain. You could have the emergence of new centers of, that want to pursue technology. The Gulf Cooperation Council countries are agitating robustly in this regard. The literature coming from there and the rhetoric of their leaders sings the song of technology. And therefore, they want to be at the heart of technology. And if India plays its cards well, it could link up with these new adventures that they are shaping. But what were these populist leaders like during this extraordinary calamity the world saw? Perhaps the worst calamity since the Second World War. Their record is absolutely abysmal. They, none of them showed any sign of governance, any capacity for governance. All of the countries led by populist leaders 
are at the top of the dev of the devastation that we saw during the pandemic in terms of infection, in terms of death. They were at the vanguard. And they also continuously showed the near total absence of application of leadership. And I argue to you, because I said this a year ago, roughly a year ago in the early days of the pandemic, that the pandemic was the first, was the first event that would enable us, public uh, political science scholars, enable us to evaluate the performance of populism. We had never tested them before. They had taken advantage of a certain situation and galloped forward into leadership. Here we were able to test them. And a year ago, I found them seriously wanting. I analyzed the performance of four distinguished leaders, Donald Trump, Bolsonaro, Boris Johnson, and Narendra Modi. Nine months later, you are reaffirmed in your assessment that they are incapable of governing. They are capable of winning uh, elections, but they are incapable of governing. And what is the reason? The very qualities that put populist leaders into leadership positions are the ones that ensure that they will not be able to lead the country in times of crisis. What are their great qualities? Self-centered and self-absorbed. A conviction that they have all the answers and do not need experts and they do not need expert advice. They govern on the basis of slogans and theater. No gravita, no in-depth study, no under. They remain essentially throughout their reign polarizing. The essential quality is to divide. We sing the song today on the pandemic that we should all be working together. And yet the reality is that there is no working together left to these people because they do not have, they have to remain polarizing figures. Where do we go from here now? I'm sure all of us would love to hear that the pandemic has killed off the populist. My answer sadly is the opposite. It's not going to happen. There was a very short period in some European countries where certain European leaders were applauded for their performance team leaders like Angela Merkel. But the fact is, as we look at the future, we see two or three things that are factual. Number one, that populism is now an integral part of democratic politics. Even if you do not have a populist leader, even a mainstream leader adopts populist policies. You see uh, Macron oh, in front of us, now besieged because of poor governance with regard to domestic economic issues and social issues and the challenge from the right, he is shifting more to the right beyond Marine Le Pen. And of course, the example is of this uh, act relating to Muslims and to Islam is supposed to bring him a pop. It's a very populist initiative. So you will see many others constantly taking populist initiative even if they are not populist themselves. But you will find many of them will be there. Where then does that leave us? We are going to face a very serious economic crisis. In people in acute distress are likely to turn once again to populist leaders. And populist leaders are likely to come forward with populist economic policies. As the nations slump, into, uh, into an economic abyss, you are likely to find these are the peoples who will wave the flag of nationalism, particularly of cultural nationalism. Try to pamper ordinary people with subsidies, with slogans, and with the idea that they are a unique people and what they have suffered is nothing due to them or due to the leader himself. It is due to some other scapegoat. So the scapegoating is going to get a certain definition. At the end, what are we likely to see? My own sad conclusion is we are going to see more of the same. We are going to see the return of the Messiah who will come with the promise that he has an Eldorado in front of his eyes and he will lead the people to that Eldorado. But what he will lead them to into a deeper abyss. 
thank you so much tell me you gave us a lot to think about i mean you know the the dilemma was very interesting that on one hand these populist leaders are supposed to be the voice of the marginalized but then they are unable to govern the very marginalized that they speak on behalf of and then therefore they you know depend on polarization and so on to stay in power i mean it's a very very dismal sort of scenario but unfortunately there in many places i think what we do hope is that you know maybe democracy helps in some places but i think you've summed up the uh, the impact of the pandemic it was already there but the the sharpening of the impact of the pandemic on the political landscape so with this we've had three wonderful presentations i'm going to look for questions in the chat box and i did see one question uh if i could just take that that is um directed to um dr raja mohan and it is from rohit narayan who is the founder of the indian forum for public diplomacy he says india has been trying to put international cooperation at the cornerstone to combat cross border and international terrorism is it a cardinal mistake because we see some countries have represented the interests of the perpetrator within their own foreign policy establishments and prepared to damage india so i think he's basically talking about countries who uh, make uh, i think terrorism uh, supporting terrorism part of their foreign policy right over to you i don't think it is a mistake actually by engaging the international system i think we managed to increase the pressure on pakistan uh, if you keep it purely national that is my interest versus pakistan's interest uh, that that we had less success uh, while your case might be genuine you know that just because we think our case is genuine i mean don't expect everyone to just to buy that in uh, because we think we are right because countries have other interests but as pakistan's uh, as the source of terrorism uh, became clearer to many and were directly hurt that there was a change of perception and this this international cooperation has not come through the un system it's actually come through the fatf uh the the financial action task force uh, which has actually for nearly now two and a half years has kept pakistan in a gray list uh, which has created a whole range of uh, consequences for pakistan economy so i think we have to keep trying that doesn't mean the rest of the world is going to save you from cross border terror that in the end can we manage and fix the problem in our own borders because a, a, a part of it is in ourselves second can we deter pakistan from supporting terrorism through military and other means bilaterally and third use diplomacy so it's not that one or the other it, it has to be a combination of, of all the three and i think in all the three fronts we've seen uh, we've seen some progress uh, that uh, india's uh, actions to ex, you know intensify its deterrence i mean some people say it has not worked but the fact is uh, if you see the debate in pakistan in the last few days uh, there is uh, the general bajwa has talked about uh, recasting pakistan's geo politics away towards geo economics uh, there is some talk in pakistan about uh, article 370 is okay the problem is article 35a so i think there are there are interesting debates going so and i think in pakistan for us we need to work on all the three fronts strengthen domestic capacity to deal with terrorism Uh, expand deterrence vis-a-vis -vis those who promote terror bilaterally and three uh, use the diplomatic levers uh, to the extent that we can that we can win win the international support thank you raj um i i see another question um i don't really know it's more like a comment it's from someone called samanya sharma uh, is it a a comment or a question samanya because it says um, um, ambassador emma stated that the highest number of cases are in populous states she has given a question now coincidentally these are also highly populated states could we share there's could we then say there is a connection between populism and population the when we uh, by remarks relate to governance by populous state not all the states are populated and there are many states that are a very large population that were not so adversely affected so i don't see uh, i don't think my remarks were connected with the uh, populism and population i think that would be a very facile look i am looking at united states 
Brazil, India, and the United Kingdom. I must also admit that the United Kingdom more recently seems to have done better, not because the quality of leadership changed. Boris Johnson still remains an object of ridicule and a near total absence of any leadership quality. The point is the United Kingdom has the world's best health system. It's an integrated health system of which every United Kingdom citizen is a part. So initially when you had serious breakdown in the national capacity to handle the pandemic, when it was still within the political realm, you found the United Kingdom at rock bottom in terms of performance. But once the system took over, you find that they have done actually quite well. So there you see that there is a system in play that was able to cross the caprices of a populist leader. But all the other states, even today, continue to have an extremely poor record in terms of handling the great challenge, the first great challenge that a populist leader faced in the in present times. Thank you, uh, Ambassador Emma. There's another question. Populism in India at the center is degrading the status of the regional state governments. But there's also some hope that some state governments in India, uh, despite various difficulties, are performing well. What is your take in it? Uh, there's one more, and I think this um, I will direct to Dr. Vaslekar, and then I think that will be the end of the questions. It says, if India had focused on enhancing HDI ranking, probably today we would have been in a better situation. India ranks 131 out of 189 countries. What is your view? Uh, I think we'll end with that. There's one about, will China take over Taiwan uh, to Dr. Raja Mohan? But I think that we'll have to keep it for another session. First, very so, quickly, yeah, uh, yes. the question uh, refers to India's political, is a federal order where you have a center and what you are hoping for, hoping against hope, that at least some state government will emerge that will challenge the authoritarian interventions of the center. Uh, this is what has happened in Brazil, in Brazil, that you have one of the worst governments during this period is in Brazil, where the center is at war with the state, where the governors of the various provinces have attempted to manage the pandemic through social distancing, masking, partial lockdown, etc., And this has been objected to by the president who thinks this is all rubbish. But that in the case of India, the scenario has been quite different. The lead with regard to the management of the pandemic was taken by the central government. And for most of the year, it was the central government that calls the shots. And that happened even in the early part of this year. Therefore, every aspect of the, the announcement of the lockdown and the various rules attending it, extension of the lockdown, agreement to have certain uh, relaxation, uh, organization of visits just on the eve of the breakout of the, pand of the pandemic, and then scapegoating certain people uh, because of the, in the early stages of the, of the pandemic, and then relaxing, the, creating the atmosphere of total relaxation giving the message to ordinary people that, look, we, have, we won. India is this great country. We are the Vishwa Guru. We won. They declare victory and go home. And then you went into a completely alternative life with regard to marriages, with regard to festivals, with regard to elections, etc. And then you got the reality. At this time, you find that the center is moving back and shifting certain important responsibilities to the states. And that is why you find a certain tension. Much of this that is happening is not connected with better management of the pandemic. It is more connected with saving, <laughs> saving the center at a time of grave national crisis, saving individuals and saving the institutions of the center that have let the country down very badly at a time of very great national crisis. Thank you, Talmi. It's been very, very sort of not minced your words at all. Uh, Dr. Vaslekar, there was a question on the HDI ranking of India. And I think with that, we won't take any more questions, but we really look forward to seeing what is, what is it that India can do? I think in a way, all three of you have talked about the socioeconomic aspects of this. 
because we're finally looking how is it going to affect India, India's foreign policy, of course, but of course, India as a state. So we look forward to hearing from you, Dr. Vasek. Thank you, uh, Ambassador. Uh, Wadwa, uh, I, I will answer that question, but I just want to make one brief comment on uh, the presentation made by Ambassador Talvez uh, Ahmad, and then I will answer this question on the HPI. Uh, uh, Ambassador Ahmad uh, uh, identified many common features of the populist leaders, but there was one which I'm sure he's aware of, but he didn't mention, that these populist leaders also tend to be the ones who are uh, generating arms threats. They want to spend more and more on arms. They want to acquire weapons. Uh, it's exactly the countries where there are populist leaders. You see uh, huge uh, spending and modernizing of uh, modernization of weapons. They are the ones who either have nuclear weapons or uh, want to have more nuclear weapons. So if you think there are going to be more populist leaders, it also means there is going to be more of arms race and great threat to the, to the international security. And, an, and a threat to international security from this kind of arms race would be much bigger than threat from any pandemic. So that was just one small comment on, on what uh, Ambassador Talmud is. Now, with regards to the HTI, uh, it's uh, very obvious. If you look at the countries which have high HDI, like uh, many of them are the Scandinavian countries, uh, Northern uh, West European countries, some countries in uh, Southeast Asia, these are the countries where you would find uh, uh, that the impact of pandemic has been relatively, comparatively speaking, limited. These are also the countries where you would find that populist leaders don't emerge, as Talmud uh, uh, Ahmad was talking about this issue. These are also the countries which don't indulge in arms race. These are also the countries whose leaders, when they go for UN General Assembly session in uh, New York, stay in relatively modest uh, four-star, five-star hotels. And the countries which are low on HDI are the ones, uh, many of them pursue arms rates either at the regional level or at the global level, are the ones which are facing uh, crisis uh, of pandemic a lot more seriously, are the ones whose leaders stay in Waldorf Astoria when they go to uh, New York for the UN General Assembly uh, sessions. So there is a difference between the countries that pursue human development and the countries that disregard human development. Uh, uh, and those that disregard also the countries have very high violence quotient, have troubled relationship with their neighbors. The ones with high HDI don't have troubled relationship with their neighbors. So these are some coincidences. I'm not trying to make any uh, um, uh, cause and uh, uh, effect relationship here in one minute. So what is the implication for future? Uh, as Ambassador Vado was saying, it's clear. Do you want to be a country which is pursuing high HDI and a good life, good happiness, pursuit of happiness for people? Or do you want a country which is, which is uh, to have a low HDI and, and, and does not indulge in pursuit of happiness for people, but indulges in pursuit of power for the elite? That's the question that the people of India have to answer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vaslekar. No, quite true, honestly. And um, I think we've had very, very comprehensive presentations uh, and the discussions. So I'm not really going to try and sum up this because I think all the points um, have been very pertinent and we've had a good discussion on it. Um, what I think we all look forward to is in this post-pandemic uh, world. I mean, what India is going through now is absolutely terrible. Sitting in Delhi, I could tell you that. But I hope we have the resilience and the power to recover soon. After the first wave, we did. And all this migrant labor that went across India and we saw terrible scenes, you know, they all came back. And I know in that in most of the big, you know, corporate India came back and said they were all back. So I do hope, A, that we're able to recover. Two, that we really take anticipatory measures if this is going to happen again. We have protocols in place so that our people don't suffer. I think that's the most important thing that we take away from here. So uh, thank you very much. I must um, acknowledge the presence of Professor Mojumdar who has sat through our discussion. Thank you so much, sir. So wonderful to see you here. And uh, thank you, um, the Professor Lavale for getting us all together. And I thank the participants. It's been extremely interesting and wonderful to see all of you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you thank you, Ambassador. So thank you very much to, to the panelists, to the chair, and of course, uh, Dr. Mujumdar, sir, you have very patiently, you have, you know, sat through the entire session and, uh, you know, I was informed that he's going to attend all of the sessions 
today and tomorrow. Uh, just talking about uh, resilience and uh, what Dr. Vaslekar pointed out and anticipating or rather the future scenario. I think this is where education plays a very important role because uh, by, by creating resilient uh, citizens through robust education systems, I think we would be able to prepare our next generation or our generational cohort uh, to take on these challenges and possibly find opportunities as well as possible solutions. So thank you very much. And uh, I wish we had had a little more time for more questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.